Hi, my name's Professor Richard Harvey. I'm a rhinologist and I practice out of Sydney, Australia. Being a rhinologist makes me part surgeon, but also an immunologist of the upper airway. Hi, my name is Dr. David Chin. I'm an ENT surgeon and rhinologist practicing in Singapore. And uh, my focus is on conditions of nose and sinus. So I think, David, for most people who develop significant CRS with polyps, that they need surgery at some point in their disease management. It serves two purposes. One, it removes polyploid tissue that's formed. Uh, that's a tissue remodeling in response to chronic inflammation in the airway and, and doesn't simply just resolve with medical treatment. And then the, the other part of surgery is that it provides a sinus cavity that's accessible to topical therapies. I think patients, once they have surgery, they should go on a, a corticosteroid irrigation. Uh, I think irrigations get into the sinuses better than simple sprays. Um, but then after that, I think if one is managing someone with CRS with nasal polyps, you have to assess how good a job you're doing. If you get great control, you will for many patients with that approach, uh, they can be back titrated. So their topical therapies can be reduced from a daily regime to every other two or three times a week, that's reasonable. But in the opposite direction, patients who don't have great control of their disease, where they have a high burden of ongoing baseline symptoms, chronic edema in their airway. I think these are patients that really make a great candidate for biologics. I think patients who never normalize their sinus cavity after surgery, it's always chronically inflamed, make another great candidate that are probably gonna be useful for biologics. And then there are patients, David, I think, who um, get control of their disease, but they're reasonably brittle. If they get a virus or something small, everything flares and they're back in your office, you know, seeking antibiotics and on corticosteroids. And I think, I think you can probably treat those patients, you know, maybe once or twice in a year with a short course of oral steroids. But I think if that becomes a bit of a pattern where they're using oral corticosteroids two or three times in a year, year on year, if you look at their oral corticosteroid use at that point, it usually exceeds 500 milligrams a year year on year, and that, that's in a time when you end up in a zone where you're likely to see side effects from oral corticosteroid use. And, and so I think that sort of cumulative oral corticosteroid use, whether it be given intermittently in short courses, then they make good candidates for biologics. And of course, the, the obvious patient group is anyone who's on the need for regular corticosteroid, that, that they are absolutely should be considered for swapping the biologics. And I find that you've described the whole spectrum of possibilities that might occur at any point along the patient's pathway. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's important for patients when they come to see you for the first time, and that, that's probably what you do to describe that all these possible scenarios could occur. You could predict based on what you, you see at the first time when you've, when you've seen them. But uh, in each patient, it's a different pathway. And in terms of the use of biologics or any other treatment modality, it's they have to, the, the best chance is that they understand what role each component of that treatment plan does. Mm. And that allows, for me anyway, the, the uh, chance to use it when the time comes if it's needed. Mm. Otherwise, sometimes when patients, for instance, you have described a situation where the edema doesn't fully settle after surgery two months out, for instance, two or three months. And, and the question to the patient is, what, what is surgery done? So I think it's really important, as you said, to start out laying out the understanding of, of the disease and what treatments there are and how they are meant to work. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Because ultimately, it's not about the surgery. I mean, when patients ask me about the surgery, I say the surgery is not going to do anything for your condition per se. I'm very clear about that as a surgeon. I say the surgery sets you up so that as, as a caring team managing this chronic condition, we, we're, we're setting you up for local treatments to work. And, and really avoiding needing to fall back to systemic therapies like oral corticosteroids to treat the condition. And I think as long as patients understand that, it's very important. Now, I think some surgeons have to be very careful if, if their ego it doesn't allow them to sort of acknowledge that surgery doesn't actually fix the condition. Uh, that's a real problem because there's absolutely no evidence that an operation changes the natural history of this condition at all. It really is the control of the underlying inflammation that, that is what the whole treatment strategy is about. So 
we, we spoke about, you know, when to integrate biologics into someone's care. Now, I, we, we agree that, you know, surgery plays an important role. It sets people up to use local treatments and avoid systemic corticosteroids. But, but I do think we need to acknowledge that probably we, we have to identify those patients who aren't doing well on that strategy. And, and my feeling is, Deborah, that you, you can pick those patients within the first 12 months after surgery. Within the first six to 12 months, you can tell very quickly if someone's not gonna be doing well with topical therapy. And I think there's lots of studies by colleagues to show that if you look at the time to recurrence after nasal surgery, and we assume that there's compliance with local treatment, um, you know, it, you start to see it from about six or 12 months in, in people who have active disease um, who aren't getting control. And, and I think, and I think it's probably that first year after surgery that we need to identify patients who might be suitable for, for some other intervention other than relying on topical therapies. The other situation is for patients who first come to see you, Richard, who have had surgery before, maybe one, two or three surgeries, and you know this is severe disease, is, is that a consideration for starting biologics at that point in time, even before doing a revision surgery? Yeah. I, and I think that's a timing thing. So if you look at some of the data, David, around how soon after surgery should we start biologics? If you start biologics years and years and years later after their last operation, the chances that they're going to have tissue remodeling, such as new polyp formation in their nose, is very, very high. And simply just putting them on a biologic at that stage without a plan for further surgery or anything else is not as effective as starting that biologic early on after their last surgery. And so when you ask me the question about someone who comes to me, if they do have severe disease and their surgery was only recently, like within the last one or two years, you, you, I think you're absolutely right. If the polyps haven't reformed, there's a lot of edema and swelling in the sinuses, they may simply just at that point need to go on a biologic agent. But I think the further and further you get out from their last surgery, the longer the inflammation's been there, the longer tissue remodeling and polyp formations had a chance to take effect, then there is a component to their nasal blockage in particular that's, that's not going to get better by then starting things like biologics. And there's actually evidence in that. So if you look at some of the phase three drug trials that, that were done in biologics, time since their last surgery was a significant factor in, in looking at treatment effect and uh, response. I, I think perhaps if, if, they're, if they're reasonably a fair way out from their last surgery and you, their polyps have reoccurred, uh, I think they make a good candidate for biologics, but it might be a strategy where you're going to start the biologic but it's not the biologic alone. There's a plan to go back in and remove the polyps that have formed since, well, prior to the biologic being started. And it's this concept that if you look at phase three trials in biologic, they are great drugs at controlling the inflammation. So quality of life and symptom scores improve. But if you actually look at the polyp reduction scores in, in phase three trials, across all biologics, it's pretty poor. And, and that's not surprising. I, you wouldn't expect polyps to disappear just because you turned off the inflammatory uh, switch. Um, and so, I, so I, think, I think that means that for many patients who, who do have significant polyp regrowth, uh, you might just want to have a strategy that it's not just a biologic, it's going to be a biologic and a revision procedure, but then the maintenance therapy after this next procedure is going to involve not just topical treatment, it's going to be topical treatment and a biologic, and that's the strategy for getting their disease under control. I think when you talk about other biomarkers for the right phenotype, we then get into this world of, you know, for a T-surgeon endoscopically, you are seeing polyps coming out of the middle meatus rather than just the center part of the nose that you see in allergy. I think there are patients who have classic eosinophilic mucin. I think as doctors, when you start investigating these patients, often their serum or blood eosinophil levels are high. Um, I think when it comes to their lower airway, they often have uh, respirometry abnormalities such as an FED1 um, uh, uh, restriction. They often have a reversibility of lung function in their lungs and their expired nitric oxide is often high. All signs of eosinophilic airway inflammation. Um, but, I, but I think if, you, if we have to pick a couple of simple things, diffuse disease, response to corticosteroid and coexisting asthma is almost something that you don't even have to be a doctor to uh, put together as a nice phenotype.
That's right. Most of the patients actually do have all of those. They tick all those boxes mm. in, in general. I think when it, when if I think of patients who aren't suitable for biologics, I, I definitely think that patients who are unlikely to have their symptoms produced by type 2 disease. So patients who come in with terrible post-nasal mucus and unexplained cough, now even though they are symptoms of the upper airway, they often have their origins in other conditions, whether it be extraesophageal reflux, um, bronchiectasis, there may be other factors contributing here. And this is not going to respond to sort of biologic therapies. I think patients who have unilateral polyps there's a few conditions like fungal rhinosinusitis and a misdiagnosed benign growth that I think we should be very cautious of patients with unilateral sort of symptoms. Or uh, another way I think about it is that there are some conditions that can be confused for or mistaken for chronic sinusitis with polyps or pseudophilic chronic sinusitis. For example, patients with a high history of allergy and they've got polyps mainly in the central part of the nose, mm. central part of the airway disease. So for, for many clinicians that just off the bat fits the criteria for chronic sinusitis with polyps, which is why you were alluding that that's a rather uh, crude way of classifying disease. Mm. And so if those patients went on to have the biologics, they might work, but they, they're probably not the right treatment for them in the long term because there, there's better treatment for, for that, which is immunotherapy. So I, I think for ENTs or patients, sometimes that kind of confusion may, may create the, or the conditions where the biologics used where it probably isn't required.